And you're listening to A Little Too Quiet, the Ferndale Library podcast. It's brought to you by the Friends of the Ferndale Library. My name is Jeff Milo, and joining us on the podcast today is Aaron Blatt. Aaron Blatt has been on the podcast before. He is a teacher. He teaches at Ferndale Middle School English and Literature. He also is our collaborator in hosting the Middle School Book Club. That's something that our youth librarians help facilitate, and it is a monthly meet up for middle school students and we select books for them and we meet and we discuss it with them and Aaron Blatt is there of course. Now Aaron's been teaching for 20 years which we talk about on the podcast. I recently had the Ferndale Public Schools Teacher of the Year Stephanie Gazicki, who's the reading specialist at the high school. It turns out Aaron Blatt used to be a reading specialist as well but we're really here talking a lot not just about reading and books but really just a lot of stuff because it's been really a a heavy, heavy couple of years for everyone. But we're looking at it through the lens of what has it been like to be a teacher during this time and being hyper, hyper aware of what is it like to be a student during these last two years, absorbing all of the tension that has been going around in the world today. So what sort of sensitivity is perhaps required of a teacher to bring into their classroom? What sort of heightened sensitivity is required for what they may be going through? So what we're here to talk about is how we are really, all of us, just going through a lot lately. And what does that mean when we get into a classroom? What does that mean for our teachers and our students? And what does it mean especially now that we are seeing an expanded appreciation for, an expanded awareness of the work that needs to be done in changing our thinking around the approach to teaching. Obviously, that's a big subject and we certainly can't get to all of it within one hour. But if you just want to hear a stream of conscious conversation between myself and a teacher and just hear what it has been like, this is the episode for you. We're also going to be talking a little bit about the middle school book club that we co-host with Aaron Blatt. And we barely get to it, but we do talk about the middle school library that Ferndale staff have been integral in helping to establish very recently, a a new middle school library, which I think we'll be talking about a lot more on the next episode that Aaron Blatt will come back for later in the spring or summer. But here's our chat with middle school English and literature teacher Aaron Blatt. Well, last year was very difficult and it was very, it was bizarre. It was a very difficult year. It's got to be, I don't know if it's any harder than any other age to be trying to especially keep middle school student aged kids engaged and connected, especially when you had to spend, what is it, a full entire year separated from them? And now we're three or four months back into the veritable groove with them. I just, um, how's it going? <laughs> That's a great, I appreciate your very thoughtful setup. Cause yeah. I mean, I, I think. Cause high school kids, they're almost adults. They are almost. I subbed in a high school in Ann Arbor when I was in college and that was it. And sure. I, I really know very little, they're, they're developmentally very different than the world that I've been in for the last 20 years. I know that what I do is I I work with sixth graders and sixth graders themselves are, they're their own thing. I sure. think even relative to middle schoolers. Sure. Because they are still, they have like an elementary heart I've always talked about, but they, you know, and an eagerness to please, but also it's a transitional year. It is. Yep. And so to your question and trying to bring joy into school and, you know, engagement, you talk about engagement, you know, there, we haven't, we had an engagement problem with students, especially, you know, students of color, students that I think are students that have historically been on the margins. They have not been engaged (laughs) <laughs> for a hundred years. Because the know? content hasn't engaged them. The, the content hasn't represented them on the page. They haven't. It yeah, hasn't. Yeah. And, and I work with people that have gone out of their way, I think, to try to bring representation, yeah. literature, you know, uh, and it's deeper than just, okay, we've gone through the motions of representation. We're going to, we're going to bring some books with African-American characters in it or Asian or whatever. And that, and then, you know, we did our, we, we can check off. It's, it's deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And there's a term that we're currently using a lot in education called being culturally responsive. Mm-hmm. And it's a term, uh, Zaretta Hammond is a professor. She's one of the big wigs in the, in the field mm-hmm. and bringing a type of thinking that, you know, trying to shift the mindset of teachers. You know, most of the teachers that are sitting in front of kids are white. Mm-hmm. Okay. And mm-hmm. a lot of them tend to approach kids of color 
there is this tendency, and I'm taking the long way here, but sure. there's this tendency to, I think, as a teacher, there is a deficit mindset around um, students of color. Mm -hmm. And there is a tendency to want to, you know, water down the curriculum mm -hmm. or create things that are easier because they think that they can't get it. Right. And, I, you know, I don't believe in any of that and I never have. I have worked in a lot of places where those structures and that mentality mm -hmm. exist and are perpetuated. It, it is a very hard thing to do to undo 150 years or 100, how many years we've had public education mm -hmm. uh, uh, of how we've done education. It's hard. It's hard mm -hmm. to do this. This is hard. And to really be culturally responsive, it's more than just representation. Sure, it, sure. It's understanding culture. You see, there's also this equation that all black and brown kids are also of poverty. Mm -hmm. And that's just, there, that couldn't be anything further from the truth. Mm -hmm. And no, no doubt poverty exists. Our impoverished students were double hit, right? Mm -hmm. In a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? They, they were hit by a pandemic and then they were hit by poverty. And there was great things that happened out of the pandemic with uh, the CARES Act and some money that was given to families and stuff like that. But poverty is poverty and it still is a, a striking it, it, it hit. And we saw it and, and we're seeing it. Our students it's not that like the halls of where I work are crazy because they aren't, um, they can be, <laughs> mm -hmm. but no, and no other, I mean, all middle schools are like that. Sure. You know, you're, you're seeing, there was an article in the wall street journal yesterday about kids are coming back and there's more fights mm -hmm. e even in more affluent districts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've just, just a, a week or two out of one of the, I mean, the biggest tragedy in Oakland right. County. And I'm not connecting that tragedy to the pandemic, but. Well, that tension reverberates. It and, does. And these kids absorb it, whether whether they're aware of it or not. And then it comes up, it bubbles up. Right. There's no question. In the place I, I work did a very controversial thing, and uh, which I thought, I think some of the people that I work with would say that it was a good thing. And some of the people I th would say it was a bad thing. And that is they you know actually took the school resource officer out of the school mm. and you know replaced it with, with a social worker mm -hmm. or two. And I think that if we saw more of that, we might. And I know I don't know how we got to here from where we started, but the pandemic has brought a tremendous amount of stress on our students. Sure, and they are back sort of five days a week, working with you know trying to after being home for two years and sometimes not the best environments, and now back to sort of doing school nor in a normal sense. Mm -hmm. It's been difficult, and right. so uh, tensions have been high on and off. But there's also there's a tremendous amount of joy. Like sure. these kids are very grateful and sure. happy to be back. Sure. Happy to, you know, have the mask on. Sure. Happy to be, can't wait, to, you know, we don't talk about it very often, but you know, though, if they volunteer, you know, they're happy to get the vaccine. Sure. And happy to share that information sure. with everybody because they want to be, you know, they want to return to normal. And Absolutely. it's still, it's not a hundred percent normal, but all these issues intersect, man. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. and the pandemic was an opportunity. The pandemic presented some issues. It shined a light on issues that were already there. Oh, absolutely. Engagement was there, yeah. the lack of engagement, and not just with children of color. The way we do school, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think fundamentally probably needs to change. You know? Well, you know what? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about all of this tumult that has created that threadbare that has thrown everything into that sharp, sharp relief. And obviously this <laughs> Ex extreme, extreme stress that has been reverberating throughout not just grown up adult teachers, but trickling all the way down to kindergartners. They are all absorbing it. And, you know, this is, I, I can't, I want to speak in hyperbole, but this is probably the most tumult that any, uh, that, 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 that we've, that we've experienced within a condensed period of time since 1968. I mean, goodness right. gracious, right. all, all this stuff happening at once. It's been, you could say it's been a rough two years. It's really been a rough five years. You know what I mean? So, yep. But I like that you've gone here because I think it's worth noting, and I talked to Stephanie Gazicki about this, is that I think something that's worth remarking upon and something that's worth kind of celebrating is how there does seem to be, and you said it's and you said it's hard, hard work is happening, anything worth doing is hard. You know, there's no quick fix to some of the things we've brought up here. But nope. um I do see at least <laughs> the acknowledgement that the work has to be done, the the efforts beginning that the work has to be done, the the things in motion. And it's been 20-ish years since I was a student. Right. And you've said you've been teaching for 20 years. And I have to say that 20 years ago, I was the concept of just a reading specialist, which you were, was not there for us. You were just 
school school was very much of that that uh that pink floyd brick in the wall thing people got fed into the building and you were given the same same curriculum and you were expected to come out the fully shaped person so i do want to acknowledge that the, there's a there's a there's a new there's a new sense of compassion that wasn't there when i was a kid or you were a kid so i agree i agree yeah. jeff and you know jeff this isn't a history of public education and that would right. be a sweet deep dive <laughs> man be. you're right there is heart today And there is compassion and there is, it is different. I mean, look, you're right. And it's not even that I was taught that 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, we are making, we have acknowledged that kids, like in the middle school, we we acknowledge that kids have executive functioning issues, Mm -hmm. issues with organization. So instead of shaming or or punishing a kid into submission Mm -hmm. or whatever, Mm -hmm. or to fit, uh, you know, into the hole that we want them to fit into the square peg or whatever, we do try to work with kids. We try to work with families. Um, I think that, dude, I'm a parent. I'm a parent of a seventh grader and I have a seventh grader who, we were Ferndale residents for uh, fifth. I was Ferndale resident for 16 years, and right when the pandemic hit, I moved. Mm-hmm. And my son goes to, on paper, allegedly the third best school district in the in the state. And Ferndale, where he came from, prepared him well for the third best school in the oh, state. That's good. Okay. It was a good education. Yeah. But what he struggled with once in person learning happened mm-hmm. was you know the organization and going to classes monitoring his time these are things executive functioning things that you know we take for granted that we do maybe naturally we, mm-hmm. it's been hard as a parent of a middle schooler to teach him these things doing it with compassion with a kid that i work with for 55 minutes for a day is it's different the, again the reason why i brought that up is because i think even our parents need help with this and mm-hmm. I, I i still haven't figured out how to do that we can do family nights and we can do trainings and we can do this and that. And, you know, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to sit down with kids and give them the time and attention that they need. That's the thing about public schools is you're right. We have 538 kids at the place I work Mm -hmm. trying to reach out and be present in in the lives of each one of those kids is hard. It's an exhausting job. It's exhausting. Um, I don't know. Again, I apologize. It's been a long day. I know you're at the end. Of, he's literally at the end of the school day, folks. Literally, yes. literally. So my brain is a little bit mushy, but I think it's uh, worth noting that. I, uh, and I mentioned nurses. Yeah. I said nurses and teachers. We bring nurses will help heal you. They're dealing with your heart and your lungs. You know, maybe your broken bones. But you know, I think that you're touching on something that a lot of other teachers realize is that when they're in your orbit for those 55 minutes, you know, you're dealing with not just the whole person, which we're really appreciating and everything that comes with it and their, their unique self, their unique experience, Yep. but their minds too. Yep. And our minds are been, have been very wary lately. Every human being's mind. So. For sure. It's still hard for me, that sort of fatigue. Yeah. We taught, we heard about finishing books, mm-hmm. finishing TV shows. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just not even the fatigue I'm experiencing right now, like in this moment is mm-hmm. probably the worst it's ever been. I mean, I held it together for two, um, you know, almost a year and a half. And yeah. I just, I've never in my 20 years wanted to be on vacation more than, <laughs> than this week. And I, and, and I'm just, I'm not that guy. I don't count down to vacations. Sure. I don't, but I need a mental reset. Being five days a week with these kids, it's not even that it's been challenging. Mm-hmm. It's been exhausting. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting because they're just, the pandemic isn't over. Mm-hmm. And so we're doing life. You know, we're here masked, fully masked. Me and you are, you know, you admitted, I, I'm admitting to be triple vaccinated. We're still sure. masked, sure. you know, and this thing and that, you know, and just, it's exhausting. Yeah, it's exhausting it is, to it be is. in a pandemic, yeah. you know, and to still have a back of your mind fear that I could die from this. Yeah. You know, because our kids do think that and yeah. feel that. And they've lost parents, they've lost sure. grandparents. Um, and so death is still on the periphery of this feeling and experience and that affects them. So I don't know. It's just, it's an, it's been, it's been a year. You know, if you talk to one of my colleagues, yeah. a couple, I would say, they would say it's been their worst year. Yeah. You know, I'm very lucky. I teach sixth grade English, mm-hmm. um, sixth grade reading. Books today are better. And, and, and the, the, they're better than they were when we were kids. Mm-hmm. But the experiences in books today and literature are refl- more reflective and more interesting and they don't speak down to kids. You can hold their engagement because they see themselves, they see their lives in the literature. For me, and I have probably referenced this the last time we talked, and I believe that the literature that is best for kids is the ones that, that treats kids, that acknowledges their humanity. True. Yeah. I was just about to get into that. I was thinking in my head when you were talking about 
the classic children's literature authors of of our era um, and yeah. whoever was big throughout maybe the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the books that, that fell into our hands. It's a lot of great authors who were back in that era. I think that there were also a lot of authors who thought or regarded the uh, career of a children's author as right. um, potentially being formulaic. Uh, if they just wrote something that was maybe entertaining for the kid. Right. Or maybe the maybe the book risked talking down to the kid, but today's YA novels meet that young reader face to face, talk yep. to them like they well they talk to them as though they can handle this, yes. and I think that that is uh, there's a level of of respect I guess, and yep. and and no more of maybe that condescension that would have come with a formulaic author. They're like it's kind of it must be i imagine it must be kind of exhilarating for the young reader to be invited into a room where we're going to talk about important stuff and for a lot of the other readers out there that we mentioned at the start of the podcast you'll see or read people on the page who look like you and who have similar lives as you i've had i've had students who case and calendar is a is a trans author the king and the dragonflies is a book that i had the pleasure of reading with my seventh i have a uh, impact hour, which I probably should have mentioned. The one thing like we do different where, where I work, this may be a statewide mandate is the, they want social emotional education to be taught in schools, but some districts I think may blow that off or mm-hmm. maybe not do it with fidelity. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I really believe where I work mm-hmm. in the city that I work, we are doing it with some degree of fidelity and there's mm-hmm. there's there's intention around it. And one of the things I, I did was I read this book that I thought was really interesting and I had students in my seventh grade class, but also my sixth graders when I talked to them about it. Oh, Mr. Blatt, I, you know, I really want that book. And, mm-hmm. you know, the point that I was making earlier is that their lives, their actual lives mm-hmm. and the, the, the lives of the characters on the page are, they're not too far off. And mm-hmm. that's what I think didn't exist when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. that's important. Absolutely. To, but I know that the model that I learned under, I was like you mentioned earlier, you either got it or you didn't. Right. And if you didn't, you got, you got pushed left. along. Yep. And I think that kids... And this is the thing is that we have reading intervention in the middle school. We have, you know, you talk to a reading specialist. Mm -hmm. There are certainly kids that lack specific skills uh, that that don't know how to blend sounds or don't know sight words. They, you know, their parents probably didn't have time to drill them. Maybe they worked midnights. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were like my mom, my mom worked midnights my whole life. I just, I was lucky. I had a father who happened to be a fifth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. So he had, you know, background. Um, But kids have, you know, we forget that these parents have a lot, you know, are busy and they don't, you know, not every mom and dad, you know, there's not a work stay at home mom or, you know, uh, two parent households. Mm -hmm. And um, we forget that. And I think that is a one thing about uh, public education that we really need to kind of reconsider is meeting our families where they are. Mm-hmm. And it, I think that because we talked about learning loss and, you know, the learning loss was there. There was a great quote from Goldie Muhammad. Goldie Muhammad is brilliant, by the way, and you should look her up. Um, she talks about bringing joy to to schools. And she also talks about cultivating genius, mm. especially in black and brown students. Mm-hmm. There was a quote from her last year during the pandemic about learning loss. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, how could something be lost that was never there, you know, there in the first place. Right. There wasn't a lot of learning going on, at least and not on the kids part, on the on the people that were supposed to be teaching them. Sure. I carry a lot of the words of, you know, Zaretta Ham and Goldie Muhammad and, and many others around with me every day. And I am still very new, as I said earlier in this process, but I, I just deeply want to be better for my students, all my students. I want to acknowledge that society that we currently live in is a product of its past, Mm -hmm. you know, and its past was dicey to say the least. And I just feel like it's my responsibility as a teacher of 11 and 12 year olds to, obviously I don't want to, you know, there are developmentally appropriate conversations to have with all kids, Sure, you know, and I am still figuring out what that is. I, you know, and I believe my conversations are grounded in research and reality and I would never try to scare kids or there's no attempt to make one group feel bad about anything that, you know, but I think we need to acknowledge our past. And uh, um, again, I got off on a tangent, Jeff, and I do apologize. You know, I think that we've been talking, I actually honestly think that we've been talking about the same thing throughout the whole we have. whole chat is that we sort of have but i'm bad no no i really think that we have because i think that My you're brain. seeing oh no well at the end of the day too you're seeing a lot of 
areas of our culture, a lot of institutions kind of having this moment where they're stopping and saying, what are we doing here? What have we done before? Yeah. Why are we still doing it this way? <laughs> In every field, right, there's like this want to do things different and to see change. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of history, so maybe it's hard to see. Sure. This is as good a time as any to be asking all these questions. And I think that all of this that we've been talking about is this net gain positive of enlightenment, hopefully. Yeah. That's the name of the game is that we are, we're just trying to enlighten. It's this whole, why have we been doing it this way for so long? As difficult as this last couple of years have been um, outside of the things that go on in schools, you know, the things that were going on during the pandemic, you can't talk about education in the pandemic without talking about all the things that have gone on during the pandemic. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention that earlier, that exact point. Life has happened, you know, mm -hmm. things sure. have gone on that have been not great sure. and um, they affect our kids. And like I said, 20th year, it's been very difficult, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, you know, I feel more excited about doing my job than mm -hmm. I've ever felt. Right. Because the, the, balance, the balancing act here is that for kids who may or may or may or not have responded to school as maybe pushing it away, thinking it's not for me. They're probably responding to pressure that they are detecting, whether it is if they perceive it as from their teacher or they perceive it from the pressure to get a grade or what have you. When I say we've been talking about the same thing for the whole time, I think I've been talking about we all feel pressure. Now what happens when our students go into a building that a lot of them have usually perceived as a conductor of pressure. No doubt. So, <laughs> and in, and their families have maybe seen uh, that, yeah. you know, a lot of our students have negative feelings, historic, uh, you know, generational negative feelings around school. Yeah. Right. And uh, so what role, and this is a big questions that you don't have to ask. Don't feel pressured. To, you don't have to ha answer them, but I like, don't know if I have them, <laughs> you know, exactly. We, uh, school is such a place that uh, can rattle our sense of self-esteem. And it can uh, certainly can. It certainly can. It can, and it, it can, and we we are. Uh, it can generate self doubt because we don't know if we're doing this math equation right or if this art project looks good. Uh, right. You know, there's there's all of that, and right. Well, and that's developmentally. You know, yeah. if, at, at that age of being in in, the, in my world, which is middle school, that self awareness, mm -hmm. that self uh, doubt that mm -hmm. begins to creep in, and then throw in you know social media and the way kids use social media and the way maybe you and i use it i think is slightly different you know they, if not greatly you know what i mean yeah. and i really not to sound like an old man here but i mean i 40 is the new 60 so it is it feels that way i'm 43 so i'm i feel old it's just it's exhausting yeah i mean i would be exhausted to have i don't you know to have a tiktok account sure or, and or, you know, the way our kids use Instagram uh, or TikTok, which, you know, um, I mean, I use Instagram to look at records. Sure, uh, sure. Not it underscores the sensitivity required in your and any teacher's job right now to be aware of all of that pressure. That is, if you could, I mean, just, just imagine if the students sitting in your class at their desks, if you could, if the, if the aura of anxiety surrounding them was visible like some sort of ultraviolet light it would be just radiant you know yeah you know having empathy for that and yeah it's it's difficult to i mean i think it is difficult to put ourselves in the shoes of our kids you know having kids helps listening to your kid but and that is difficult i don't think any a lot of adults listened to us mm -hmm. you know when we were growing up maybe some some didn't I, i'm still like i said it's easy to it's easier to listen to the kids I work with than yeah. it sometimes is my own son. By the time I get home, and that's a that's one of my personal like life goals is to like be the, the dad that listens that instead listens. of like talks. Yep. So, um, no, yeah, I I I know. So. so important. Let's move into this next phase of the interview and just talk about the positivities that can be generated by reading a book and talking about books. Not not even just the assignments you might have or, or essays or what have you, but we always love that we get to be able to do a middle school book club with you, with yeah. students, with our librarians. And it's really I've great. been thinking about, and you as a lifelong reader, reading books, it's your thing. Uh, reading well, I'm not a life, I'm not a lifelong well, <laughs> reader. I, I have a, I had my own tumultuous relationship. So you can appreciate it. I can. You can appreciate it. Cause, cause of the, 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 the literature that was, that was 
brought to me didn't mm. speak to me and i think the way in which it was brought to me and i think also the people that brought it to me they just expected that i you know that we were supposed to okay you know do it right you know and i i don't think i mean it's just that common that's part of the reason why i got into this whole thing in the first place absolutely so, so you mentioned the word empathy and and i certainly don't want to distill the nuances and complexities of any individual's experience when they are entering a book and interacting with it for 300 pages. But I do think that if we single out anything that is paramount, it is the characters that they get to meet in each book. Me as a reader, when I open a book, that means I am going to be able to meet someone and I'm going to not only go along with them on their journey, and, and I not only learn about their backstory, but I'm, I'm simply spending time with them. And however that author has decided to craft that character is very, very important. Uh, so the reader is just that individual exchange between them, not, not even so much between them and, and the story that the author has concocted, which is, you know, fun. We love plot twists and all that, but mm-hmm. uh, just getting a chance to meet these characters. And we talked earlier about how YA books are just are richly full of of amazing characters compared to the 80s or 90s or or, or what have you. So I think that's I, I, important to note. It is. And, you know, this year I've made actually a conscious effort to um, not teach a full novel, taking up what could be potentially a month or two months of class instruction time mm-hmm. to, to uh, read a novel is not as beneficial as maybe exposing kids to five to ten different short stories. And so this year I've really made an effort to try to teach short stories and, you know, short stories are their own thing, I guess, relative to, you know, they're, they are different in terms of structure, but I mean, my kids were exposed to some, I think, like you're talking about, you know, sitting down with, you know, with a, with a character or whatever. And uh, we read uh, Jacqueline Woodson's uh, Main Street. It's a short, short story. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jacqueline Woodson's a YA author who's written some beautiful, larger books that she's very well known. And but this be- the story Main Street just really spoke to me, and I thought, oh, this would be great because I was we were doing something with characterization in uh, literature, and I thought instead of, you know, it, historically I've done a novel, and I we read uh, there's a couple of different novels I've read over the years, mostly by white authors, mm-hmm. and so Mary Downing Hahn, uh, she wrote a book called Close for the Season. Mm-hmm. It's an absolutely wonderful book. She's a great writer of mystery and stuff and you know but in and, and even the characters were good and well written but it just you know it just wasn't it was time it was time for a change and a time to rethink and so anyways i found this main street story and it was really cool to see in class in the, in a matter of less than five days um how much the work of being an english teacher is more than just like i yeah i teach reading but then i have to teach you know the 20 to 40 to 50 to 70 vocabulary words that we take for granted i think as readers you know characterization uh mood plot you know conflict all these different sort of things that help i think students navigate and understand you know complexities of a novel right and that's the part of you know it's actually kind of interesting and the, the only part of my job i hate is teaching grammar that sucks um, <laughs> but Students um don't enjoy it either they don't they no. do not but um anyways you, you know so it was just interesting that i i felt like i accomplished like a novel's worth of learning in four to five days we also read which was mostly because it was just it really um did a really 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 good job of of teaching mood, mm-hmm. and that was uh, we read Ray Bradbury's All Summer in a Day, which is a it's a really beautiful. You know, Ray Bradbury is, is a great writer of, and, he, and it's very uncommon to see, although not you know, there's adult young, um, science fiction sure. writers that short stories in the science fiction realm are more sure. like seventy to eighty pages. It feels like, anyways, this was like a really short short story, and it's just absolutely and it's powerful. Yeah. The kids really liked it, and uh, I was really cool too a lot a lot of ground there was you know with characterization and mood and plot and you know conflict uh again i can continue you know really i think teach these concepts in a way that's varied that you know kids you know you have to have variety mm-hmm. and variety is extremely important in in the, in the language arts room so. absolutely because i because i see this as a chance for them to meet people I'm talking about it's on the page, but they're they're getting able to meet a variety of people and yeah. hear about their life, their lived experience, and yeah. that is the heart of what 
well, one of the beautiful things reading does is that it, if you're open to it, it can nurture your sense of empathy for someone else's lived experience. And that's probably someone different than yourself. And you impart, maybe in a small way, maybe in a big way, learn about yourself based on how you react to this person. That's right. So that's the magic. It is. And like I told you, I'm, I've had my own, I was a reluctant reader. Mm -hmm. I just was. And I, I was a good reader, strong reader. But as the humanity of the characters I, I, I read about mm -hmm. slowly kind of took shape in my mind. And over time, I think it, I mean, it, it definitely helped form who I am today. Absolutely. But it was just a matter of taking the time to get there. I can only imagine today the amount of information that passes by these kids mm -hmm brains and eyes and you know the quickness of phones and TikTok and how quick and 30 second snippets and it's hard to sit down with a book a lot of my kids they want to oh can i read you know what pad i'm a big proponent of graphic novels manga whatever you want to do that's reading is reading to me yep the only thing about what pad is i just don't want them to have their phone i feel like sure. it's an excuse to have their phone but i love when my kids want to read graphic novels and I, we've there's been an explosion of really good graphic novels obviously jerry craft's book but there's been a ton other ones since you know craft's book and before craft's book uh jerry craft wrote new kid as many people probably know mm -hmm. which won the newberry award mm -hmm. in i think 19 2019 which was a big deal it was the yeah. first graphic novel to do that mm -hmm. but i saw today i thought it was interesting even the newberry people couldn't you know be different they it looked like the year that they gave jerry craft the newberry award they gave another they gave another book the award as well. Oh, kind of an asterisk situation, huh? Yeah, I don't know. So I have to do doing that. A parent had emailed me about a possible books for kids and I had rattled through a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff and I remembered this list and I looked at the Newberry list and I thought that was interesting. It wasn't an honor. Right. It was two full medal winners and I just thought that was interesting yeah, anyways. Interesting. So See, anyway. Our whole perception of what counts as reading is also in the moment of evolving. It's pain. It's growing pains everywhere. It is. So we're seeing slow incremental incremental enlightenment evolution. Yeah. I, I hope I'm around to see some more incremental changes. I know that I'm trying to like help create the next generation of and I believe this is idealistic and I still believe it. I believe that these kids are gonna go on to be doctors, lawyers, teachers, congress people the next president or whatever, or the next mechanic, whatever is, you know, I, I believe that I, I get that honor every day. And so I feel blessed to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the pathway to get there has certainly changed. I think like we've said, we, you know, education has changed. It's gotten better. There's, you know, there's career education. There's more of an acknowledgement of historical structural racism. There's, you know, more an attempt by all teachers, all teachers to, be better, to do better, to cre to create experiences that engage students, that bring joy to students. I, I like I've said earlier, joy is like this word. This is my buzzword. Yeah. You know, during the pandemic, it was pivot. Sure. Um, and now my word is joy. I think that's a great word. It is. I think it is because I want there to be joy in the life of my lives of my students. I want I want them to walk into my classroom and feel joy mm -hmm. and you know associate joy mm -hmm. with ela sixth grade ela mm -hmm. but look what we saw in the last few years and i, I i'm not here to talk politics sure, sure, sure. but i hope that the kids today certainly bring the joy, joy that we're trying to teach them and love that we try to teach them and are we crazy uh, we're you know just hippies man hippies we're are we hippies, hippies man that's I what I, so. that's that's a good way we to just say want peace and love right and no doubt and i do too and but you know humans are inherently flawed right and you know i never bring politics into the classroom sure you know my thing is is i just tried to in the world that my little space i just we treat each other we're hippies in my space <laughs> you know we treat each other with kindness with love and if anything i do carries into their personal lives i i'm, I'm i hope is that's a good thing because i try to live an authentic life mm -hmm. i share my soul with my kids mm -hmm. i am an honest teacher i teach i they know who i am mm -hmm. they know aaron blatt they they know my my faults and I and I acknowledge and talk about them. Also, make sure that they know that I'm not, you know, I'm not their friend. But mm -hmm. you know, I am. There's a there's a 
you know, I'm a teacher, they're the student, but I try to be authentic mm-hmm. and real, not in a, in a forced or fake way. I just try to be who I am and try to not speak. And much like the literature that we've been talking about, not speak to speak down on them and, and try to just acknowledge that I too am struggling with mm-hmm. like being a human. Mm-hmm. So we and, all are, we all are, we all are. I just know that joy is the word I want to end on. And I sweet. know that whenever any day uh, when I come home from school, yeah, in high school or whatever, middle school. Any day that I came home from school feeling good about school meant I felt good about myself. No doubt. You know what I mean? So that's important. Aaron, thanks for coming back on the podcast. It's been great to talk to you. Yeah, I hope this was good. It was good. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank Jeff. I want to thank you. I want to really just thank, I want to thank your just Ferndale area district library. Mm-hmm. This isn't an award speech, but I also, Michelle Williamson oh, yeah. has been an, a big part of- We didn't uh, even talk about the library in the middle school, yeah. I know, but I just- back, You'll have to come back. I would want to. And when we get that fully realized, which yeah. we're in the process of doing, yeah. it's going to be awesome. But Michelle and Trisha Vensky, mm-hmm. they've been two people at really trying to- preach the gospel of libraries and mm-hmm. i just think that that's a good stuff and uh i'm all in on that yeah. and kids need access to good literature and i want to say this the thing that i love about ferndale area district library mm-hmm. and its partnership with ferndale schools is they have gone out of their way to make the access of literature to my kids barrier free so they've acknowledged that book loss is an issue mm-hmm. they've acknowledged certain things Jordan Wright has talked to, we have the book club and he's made it so like through a grant or through money that through budgetary money or whatever has just gotten each kid a copy of the book. Mm-hmm. And the least amount, you know, the, the less barriers, I think the more and the more access, the more free access, f- you know, free access to libraries, lack of barrier, you know, because the one thing about Ferndale is that it's a entering suburb mm-hmm. that borders that that's what that has Ferndale, Hazel Park, Oak Park, and Pleasant Ridge, all students, those four, was that four? Four groups of students that come to our school. Mm-hmm. And I'm friends with many Pleasant Ridge parents, and for years, they weren't going to the Ferndale Library. They were going to the Huntington Woods Library. And Oak Park parents were going to the Oak Park Library. And Hazel Park were going to hit. And what Ferndale did, any kid with a Ferndale student ID, and a, you know, said all of those kids can go, you know, all of our kids. And it, I mean, I had Pleasant Ridge, Oak Park, and Hazel Park parents all say, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So I want to just thank you guys publicly and just say that's awesome and you know so a public library still has a tremendous amount of purpose and tremendous amount of use in our society so thank you for being there can't go out on a better note than that you got it buddy thank you And that was our chat with Aaron Blatt, teacher at Ferndale Middle School. So glad to have him on. Obviously, as I said, we we got into some heavy stuff and there's no way that we could have really gotten to it all. And we certainly can't. Uh, Even if we are opining and sharing our uh, philosophies, we certainly can't come up with all of the answers to everything we addressed. But we do appreciate you listening to this episode. That'll do it for now. It is a little too quiet. It's the Ferndale Library podcast, and it's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. The music that you hear at the beginning and end of each episode is by a local musician known as Zun Set. If you want to support this podcast, you could go to ferndalefriends.org. You could like, review, or follow us when we're out there. Leave us a five-star review or a comment. It'll help us find new listeners, or you could just tell a friend about it. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it to social media. We'll be back next week with more. Thanks for listening.